All right, so this is the Bible in seven passages. This is lesson number seven, passage number seven, and it is John chapter 17, one to three. I don't know if anybody guessed the, the right one, if that was going to be the last one or not, but it's John 17, one to three. And the title of the lesson is The Promise Fulfilled. So just in case anybody's not aware of the premise of this series here, since we're on the last, uh, last lesson, this series is based on the premise that in some future world where all digital information is processed and transmitted and stored by a kind of joint business government type agency, in this future world, the Bible somehow becomes one of those books banned because its content includes material that they feel is subversive. So this is a you know, futuristic imaginary thing here, setting. This would mean that Bibles are removed from the shelves of bookstores and digital copies are ordered deleted. Eventually no copies are left and all that remains is what people remember about the Bible. So the question that would naturally arise in a situation such as this would focus on how the information in the Bible would be spread if there were no text available. One suggestion was to select a number of passages that would somehow summarize the key ideas and teachings of the Bible that could be easily shared and passed on to keep the gospel message alive. And so this series, The Bible in Seven Passages, therefore, is an attempt to identify seven key passages that actually contain enough information to summarize the entire 66 books that make up the Holy Bible. Kind of a challenge there, but this is the one that we set for ourselves in this class. So let's do a bit of a review. The first passage we chose would be, was rather Genesis 1.1, prelude to the promise, we called it, the creation. So Genesis 1.1 is a natural one that you would choose because it is the foundational verse in the Bible because it not only explains how the world came into being, but who created it in the first place. So that would be one of our seven. Next one we chose, Genesis 3, verses 1 to 24 hear God's promise to fallen man. This passage explains how man and the creation came to be in their present fallen and imperfect condition. And in this passage is introduced a promise of redemption in the future, sets the scene. The third passage that we chose, Genesis eleven twenty seven to 12, 7 the person of the promise, part one. God's promise is given a human identity within the culture and social history of the Jewish people. And this passage here talks about the first individual selected out of which God was to, out of whom rather, God was uh, create the Jewish nation. Passage number four, Isaiah 53 verses one to 12. The person of the promise, again, same title, but part two. Here, God's promise is identified through prophecy, which describes the person and the mission of the promise, this time from a spiritual perspective. So uh, passage number three identified the promise from a physical. Who would that person be? Where would that person come from? Passage number four described that person from a spiritual perspective. What was special about that person? Passage number five was John 3, 14 to 16, the promise revealed. The details of the promise are clearly revealed and explained. And of course, the golden passage in the Bible is the one that does this so, so beautifully, John 3, 14 to 16. Passage number six, Romans chapter six, verses one to 14, the promise realized. Here, Paul the Apostle explains how the promise is realized in a person's life here on earth. Uh, in other words, the effects of grace on those who are saved. Very important uh, 
uh, passage here, Romans chapter six, defines our spiritual life in Christ. And then today's passage, the seventh and final passage, John chapter 17, verses one to three, explains how the promise is fulfilled. The seventh and final passage describes the final state of all who believed and remained faithful to the promise as they pass into the eternal realm of the heavenly kingdom. So let's read now, get into today's lesson, passage number seven. Jesus spoke these things and lifting up his eyes to heaven, he said, Father, the hour has come Glorify your Son, that the Son may glorify you, even as you gave Him authority over all flesh, that to all whom you have given Him, He may give eternal life. This is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. Now Jesus spoke these words as part of the teaching and encouragement and prayer he offered up after sharing the Passover meal with his apostles and just before his arrest leading up to his death and crucifixion. In the passage just read, Jesus refers to the suffering, the death and resurrection that he's going to experience in the days to come as the glory the Father will give him by confirming his exalted status as the divine Son of God. The glory he's going to demonstrate is by resurrecting him from the dead. A point that is also made by Paul the Apostle in Romans uh, chapter one, verse four. Paul makes the point that this is how we know that all of this is true by the resurrection of, by the resurrection of Jesus. Jesus also states in simple terms the essence of the promise, which had been made by God in the Garden of Eden, carried forward throughout history by the Jewish nation, confirmed and articulated by the prophets, and now about to be realized through His atoning death on the cross and proof of attainment for all who believed through His glorious resurrection. So Jesus signals to all believers that God's promise of eternal life was about to be made possible and the proof that He could deliver on the promise was His own resurrection from a sure and terrible death on the cross. You know, it's, the, the, the thinking is easy. I'm going to demonstrate my resurrection in order to prove that I can engineer your resurrection. So this promise and its subsequent fulfillment in his own resurrection was enough to provide hope and joy to all of his followers. But Jesus goes one step further by describing the nature of this experience referred to as, quote, eternal life. Jesus not only reveals that believers will consciously exist after they die, he also describes what this existence will be like. Not some willy-nilly promise up there you know, that you can't quite grasp. No, no, he explains what it will be like. Not just how long we will live, you know, forever, eternal, but how that experience of life will be. What exactly will that be like? So in John 17, I go back to it, in John 17, three, he says, this is eternal life. You can't get clearer than that. This, he says, is eternal life. That they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. And so, according to Jesus, the essence of the experience of eternal life is the experience of knowledge and this experience continuing without end. The believer, because of and through the agency of Jesus, will experience the filling of his being with knowledge. Here the word means intimate knowing of another. Knowledge filled with understanding, with appreciation, with enlightenment, 
with awareness of the true and living God, the Father, as well as the same knowledge of God, the Son, Jesus. And this will be possible because of two reasons. Number one, we will possess a glorified body after our own resurrection from the dead. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15, Paul explains this idea. He says, so also is the resurrection of the dead. It is sown a perishable body. It is raised an imperishable body. It is sown in dishonor. It is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness. It is raised in power. It is sown a natural body. It is raised a spiritual body. If there is a natural body, there is also a spiritual body. So also it is written, the first man, Adam, became a living soul. The last Adam became a life-giving spirit. However, the spiritual is not first, but the natural, then the spiritual. The first man is from the earth, earthy. The second man is from heaven. As is the earthy, so also are those who are earthy. And as is the heavenly, so also are those who are heavenly. Just as we will have borne the image of the earthy, we will also bear the image of the heavenly. And so this body, this glorious body, this resurrected body that he's describing here, will enable us to be in the presence of God without harm, because we will be acceptable and eternal since the glorified body will not be subject to sin or death. The second reason, the second thing that will enable us to have this existence is the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit will enable our own spirit to interact with God. Just as the Holy Spirit helped us to overcome sin, to live according to God's will, to offer acceptable prayers to God. You know, we read about this in Romans chapter 8, verse 13 and 14 and 27. He helped us do all these things. He helps us do all these things while we are alive as Christians in this present physical body. The Spirit helps us do spiritual things. Well, the same Holy Spirit will enable resurrected believers to experience the never ending growth of knowledge of God in Christ that is referred to as eternal life. Now, every religion has an afterlife scenario, every single one of them. I mean, atheisms and other, atheism and other philosophies that try to explain life without reference to God, they have a scenario for the afterlife. That scenario is there is no life, there is no consciousness. Once you die, boom, that's it, nothing, no more consciousness, it's over, forever. Hinduism and other Eastern religions, they say that the individual is absorbed into a collective mind or force where individual consciousness merges and thus ceases to be. That's their idea of the afterlife. Other monotheistic religions see the afterlife as a perfected version of life here on earth where physical and emotional appetites are satisfied. However, biblical Christianity teaches that life after death is primarily focused on a heightened understanding and knowledge of the Godhead, which through Christ, believers have become a part of. Believers have become a part of the Godhead. That means that believers will have a relationship with God based on knowledge and appreciation, not sin and death. Right now, our relationship with God is based on sin and death. Thank you, God, for forgiving me. Thank you, God, for saving me from death. Thank you, God. That's our relationship. Sin and death will be part of the physical world, which will have all passed away in judgment, destruction, memory. Believers will live in the perpetual now, and will no longer experience the yesterday, today, and tomorrow context that we have now. Eternal life consists of an ever-growing and dynamic relationship between God and believers within the Godhead. Another aspect 
of eternal life. Eternal life will be based on unfettered adoration and not service. Service was necessary and is necessary in the physical world because of the various needs created on account of sin. There's suffering and death, why? Because of sin. And suffering and death you know, raises up the needs, needs for service. Christians serve the needs of others, even the need to evangelize, because in doing so, we're fulfilling God's command to love and serve others in the name of Christ in this world. But there are no needs in the Godhead. <laughs> no needs in the Godhead. God doesn't need anything. But there will always be the natural impetus for the created to worship the Creator. This worship will no longer be impeded by human weakness, ignorance, or sin. And so eternal life will permit worship that is in spirit and truth because it will be enhanced and informed by ever increasing knowledge and understanding of the object of worship, the true and living God. The more you know Him, the more you love Him. The more you love Him, the more you are in awe of Him. The more you are in awe of Him, the more you want to worship Him. Now we're limited, we're restricted because of ignorance and sin and weakness and death. But in eternal life, there will be no restriction. Eternal life will be an existence fully realized and experienced, not only anticipated. Unbelievers and those who worshiped false gods experienced the good and bad of this life and integrated aspects of their religion through rituals and festivals and practices that somehow reflected the afterlife that they anticipated. For example, the Hindus, their ritual cleansing in the Ganges to obtain a condition of spiritual purity may have given them a momentary relief from their guilt. The Christian believer, however, begins to experience the eternal life that he anticipates after death. We, believe, we begin to experience that, uh, uh, that eternal life experience in this present life. Unlike the Hindu ceremony of purification by bathing in the Ganges River, the believer's sins are actually forgiven at baptism because God has provided an atoning sacrifice to remove them. The Christian receives actual forgiveness now and experiences the corresponding relief and joy and gratitude and peace in this world because his sins are forgiven and his eternal life is guaranteed now in this world even before he goes to the next. And so the knowing of God and its rewards is possible in this life for the Christian, however is fully realized when all the obstacles to this end that exist in this world are removed in the next world. We will exist within the Godhead, not apart from it. 1 Corinthians 15, 28. Jesus' ultimate mission was to bring man into the Godhead. Second Timothy, he says, if we endure, we will also reign with him. Well, where will he be to reign? If we deny him, he will also deny us. We will reign with him where? Well, where is he? He's at the right hand of God. Another way, another way of saying within the Godhead. Jesus changed the composition of his divine nature to include a human nature. He did not discard or change back his nature to eliminate this altered state after he ascended into heaven. We know that because we, we see him, or through the eyes of the apostles, we see him ascend as Jesus. 
Note that he appeared to the apostles and ascended back into heaven in his altered nature as Jesus, the God-man. Our faith in God, our belief in Jesus will grant us an eternal life which will allow us to forever know and experience the things only God knows and only God experiences. In a word, this ultimate knowledge and experience is perfect, eternal love. We know that this is the nature of the knowledge and understanding that eternal life within the Godhead will bring believers to because John tells us that this is the essence of God's nature and being. In 1 John 4, 7, he says, Beloved, let us love one another, for love is from God, and everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. The one who does not love does not know God, for God is love. By this, the love of God was manifested in us, that God has sent His only begotten Son into the world so that we might live through Him. In this is love, not that we love God, but that He loved us and sent His Son to be the propitiation for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. No one has seen God at any time. If we love one another, God abides in us and His love is perfected in us. By this we know that we abide in Him and He in us because He has given us of His Spirit. We have seen and testified that the Father has sent the Son to be the Savior of the world. Note that love is the touchstone for everything done by God to give believers eternal life. Love is the basis from which the promise was made, the promise was sent, the promise was completed and made the basis for its realization and its fulfillment. Love from beginning to end into eternity. Love from beginning to end into eternity. This is why all sin is really violence against love in one way or another. Hell, therefore, is existence without love, which ultimately is no existence at all since existence cannot be sustained without a measure of love. Therefore, hell does exist, but those there cannot be sustained forever, and in this is seen the judgment and mercy of God and that those who go to hell go to a real dimension of mind and sense and suffering, but cannot survive there and thus are extinguished into merciful nothingness. Mankind's end, therefore, is either intimate, loving knowledge of God within the Godhead forever, or the separation from God into nothingness forever. Well, let's hope that God will spare us the type of future that I've talked about in this series. Although sometimes you wonder when you watch TV and when you see what is going on, certainly don't want a future where access to the Bible is denied or restricted. A future where we would be forced to carry an abbreviated form of it just to summarize its message and pass it on to others. I'm not sure this could be done considering our laws, but there are many who would like to see this done. You know, the, the, the scenario that I've talked about, there are a lot of people who would say, yeah, I'm all for that. <laughs> Let's get rid of that Bible. It causes too much trouble. I certainly hope we'll never see that day when those people are in charge. However, if this did happen here in this place, I give you once again the seven passages that I would choose in order to summarize the Bible. One last time, we'll look at them. Read along silently with me and I will give them to you one more time. Passage number one, prelude to the promise. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Passage number two, God's promise to fallen man. Now the serpent was more crafty than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, indeed, has God said, you shall not eat from any tree of the garden? The woman said to the serpent, from the fruit of the trees in the garden, we may eat, but 
from the fruit of the tree which is in the middle of the garden, God has said, you shall not eat from it or touch it or you will die. The serpent said to the woman, you surely will not die, for God knows that in the day you eat from it, your eyes will be open and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. When the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was a delight to the eyes and that the tree was desirable to make one wise, she took from its fruit and ate, and she gave also to her husband with her, and he ate. Then the eyes of both of them were opened and they knew that they were naked and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves loin coverings. They heard the sound of the Lord walking in the garden in the cool of the day and the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. Then the Lord God called to the man and said to him, where are you? He said, I heard the sound of you in the garden and I was afraid because I was naked, so I hid myself. And he said, who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree of which I commanded you not to eat? The man said, the woman whom you gave to be with me, she gave me from the tree and I ate. Then the Lord God said to the woman, what is this you have done? And the woman said, the serpent deceived me and I ate. The Lord God said to the serpent, because you have done this, cursed are you more than all cattle and more than every beast of the field. On your belly you will go and dust you will eat all the days of your life. And I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your seed and her seed. He shall bruise you on the head and you shall bruise him on the heel. To the woman, he said, I will greatly multiply your pain in childbirth. In pain you will bring forth children. Yet your desire will be for your husband and he will rule over you. Then to Adam, he said, because you have listened to the voice of your wife and have eaten from the tree about which I commanded you saying, you shall not eat from it, Cursed is the ground because of you. In toil you will eat of it all the days of your life. Both thorns and thistles it shall grow for you, and you will eat the plants of the field. By the sweat of your face you will eat bread till you return to the ground, because from it you were taken, for you are dust, and to dust you shall return. Now the man called his wife's name Eve because she was the mother of all living. The Lord God made garments of skin for Adam and Eve and clothed them. Then the Lord God said, Behold, the man has become like one of us, knowing good and evil, and now he might stretch out his hand and take also from the tree of life and eat and live forever. Therefore the Lord God sent him out from the garden of Eden to cultivate the ground from which he was taken. So he drove the man out, and at the east of the garden of Eden he stationed the cherubim and the flaming sword which turned every direction to guard the way to the tree of life. Passage number three the person of promise. One. Now these are the records of the generations of Terah. Terah became the father of Abram, Nahor, and Haran, and Haran became the father of Lot. Haran died in the presence of his father Terah in the land of his birth in Ur of the Chaldeans. Abram and Nahor took wives for themselves. The name of Abram's wife was Sarai, and the name of Nahor's wife was Milcah, the daughter of Haran, the father of Milcah and Iscah. Sarai was barren, she had no child. Terah took Abram his son and Lot the son of Haran his grandson and Sarai his daughter-in-law, his son Abram's wife, and they went out together from Ur of the Chaldeans in order to enter the land of Canaan. And they went as far as Haran and settled there. The days of Terah were 205 years and Terah died in Haran. Now the Lord said to Abram, go forth from your country and from your relatives and from your father's house to the land which I will show you, and I will make you a great nation, and I will bless you and make your name great, and so you shall be a blessing. And I will bless those who bless you, and the one who curses you I will curse, and in you all the families of the earth will be blessed. So Abram went forth as the Lord had spoken to him, and Lot went with him. Now Abram was 75 years old when he departed from Haran. Abram took Sarai his wife and Lot his nephew and all their possessions which they had accumulated and the persons of which they had acquired in Haran and they set out for the land of Canaan. Thus they came to the land of Canaan. Abram passed through the land as far as the site of Shechem to the oak of Moreh. Now the Canaanite was then in the land. The Lord appeared to Abram and said, to your descendants I will give this land. So he built an altar there to the Lord who had appeared to him. Passage number four, the person of promise, two. Who has believed our message? 
and to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he grew up before him like a tender shoot, and like a root out of the parched ground, he has no stately form or majesty that we should look upon him, nor appearance that we should be attracted to him. He was despised and forsaken of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief, and like one from whom men hide their face, he was despised and we did not esteem him. Surely our grief he himself bore and our sorrows he carried, yet we ourselves esteemed him stricken, smitten of God and afflicted. But he was pierced through for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The chastening of our well-being fell upon him and by his scourging we are healed. All of us like sheep have gone astray. Each of us has turned to his own way, but the Lord has caused the iniquity of us all to fall on him. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. Like a lamb that is led to slaughter and like a sheep that is silent before its shearers, so he did not open his mouth. By oppression and judgment he was taken away. And as for his generation who considered that he was cut off out of the land of the living for the transgression of my people to whom the stroke was due. His grave was assigned with the wicked men, yet he was with a rich man in his death because he had done no violence, nor was there any deceit found in his mouth. But the Lord was pleased to crush him, putting him to grief. If he would render himself as a guilt offering, he will see his offspring, he will prolong his days, and the good pleasure of the Lord will prosper in his hand. As a result of the anguish of his soul, he will see it and be satisfied. By his knowledge of the righteous one, my servant will justify the many, as he will bear their iniquities. Therefore I will lot him a portion with the great, and he will divide the booty with the strong, because he poured out himself to death and was numbered with the transgressors, yet he himself bore the sin of many and interceded for the transgressors. Passage number five, the promise revealed. As Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, so that whoever believes will in him have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. Passage number six, the promise realized. What shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin so that grace may increase? May it never be. How shall we who died to sin still live in it? Or do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus have been baptized into his death? Therefore, we have been buried with him through baptism into death, so that as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, so we too might walk in newness of life. For if we have become united with him in the likeness of his death, certainly we shall also be in the likeness of his resurrection, knowing this, that our old self was crucified with him in order that our body of sin might be done away with, so that we would no longer be slaves to sin. For he who has died is freed from sin. Now, if we have died with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him. Knowing that Christ, having been raised from the dead, is never to die again, death no longer is master over him. For the death that he died, he died to sin once for all. But the life that he lives, he lives to God. Even so, consider yourselves to be dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. Therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal body so that you obey its lusts. And do not go on presenting the members of your body to sin as instruments of unrighteousness, but present yourselves to God as those alive from the dead and your members as instruments of righteousness to God. For sin shall not be master over you, for you are not under law, but under grace. Passage number seven, the promise fulfilled. Jesus spoke these things and lifting up his eyes to heaven, he said, Father, the hour has come, glorify your son, that the son may glorify you, even as you gave him authority over all flesh, that to all whom you have given him, he may give eternal life. This is eternal life, that they may know you the only true God and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. And the church said, Amen. Amen. All right, well a good exercise to follow up on this uh, uh, series 
would be to see which seven passages would you choose if you had to select seven passages. You only had time to grab seven passages before they burned your Bible. <laughs> which seven would you choose uh, to, go, uh, to go with you? All right, that's our lesson for today and the end of our series. Thank you for your kind attention. We are dismissed.